Thank you for those that have already joined. We will get started very shortly. Just going to give it a few more minutes, uh, just over the hour. Just give it a couple more minutes and we'll get started. Thanks for those that have already joined. Okay, uh, conscious we've got a lot to cover today, we will get started and this is being recorded. Um, so first of all, thank you for joining and welcome to the Helix webinar series. Today's session is on value of migrating BMC TSEO to BHCO. We've got uh, three presenters today. So first of all, I'll introduce you to Yaron Front, if you just want to give us a wave. And Kamal Padmara, if you want to just say hello and wave. <laughs> And then we also have Graham Brown, our Senior Principal Solutions Engineer, who's going to be doing the demo today. So we've got a couple of things just as reminders in uh, the session. We've got the Q&A section, so you can use that in Zoom if you've got any questions during the uh, session. And we will have a panellist um, answer those, and we will also have time at the end of the session to answer any live questions as well. So during the demo, during the presentation slides, feel free to put something into the Q&A. There's uh, just a couple of things I want to run by some housekeeping items. Uh, we, due to recording this, uh, we will just mention that um, because of your names, if they're showing up and you don't want those to be shared, if you can change your name. Um, so obviously by registering for this event, um, you would have needed to have opted out. Um, so if you just want to take a look at this notice before we get started. Uh, we will be sharing this on YouTube. We will also be sharing it on our BMC community site and possibly some other social media platforms. So if there's any concerns, please do let us know. When you did register for it, you would have seen this on the registration page. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Yaron, who's going to do the first part of the presenting. Thank you, Samantha. Um, so like we said, my name is Yaron Front. I'm a product manager on the Helix Continuous Optimization side. 
Um, I also have my own little legal notice, which basically says that I'm going to be making or we're going to be making some forward looking statements. And I would strongly encourage um, all of you not to make any purchase decision decisions based on these forward looking statements. So what we're going to be covering today is the value of migrating from TSEO to BHCO. And the first thing we're going to be talking about is a little bit about what's new in BHCO compared to TSEO. I'm going to start off talking a little bit about the platform, the Helix platform, what it is, what the value is, how we bring everything together. Then Komal is going to be covering the, both the road ahead. So what are we planning for Helix continuous optimization into the future? And what is the value of choosing to go into a SaaS deployment for Helix continuous optimization? Uh, then we're going to hand it over to Graham to do a live demo. And I really, really hope we're also going to have some time for a discussion at the end of the of of all this content. But rest assured, you know, we have open channels both in the community and 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 Sam does a great job of keeping in touch with with the participants. So um, if there are any questions or any comments that you want to make that we're not going to be covering today, there are always ways to to reach any one of the panelists that are on today. So let's talk a little bit about the Helix ITOM theme. So ITOM is IT operations management. So within the Helix platform, we've built four different solutions on top of the Helix platform that create a situation in which the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. So the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. What, what we mean by that is that with these four different solutions and having a common platform that allows us to share both context and data between these different four different solutions, that allows us to create a lot of value. Now, a lot of you know a, a lot of uh, companies and a lot of vendors throw around, around the word platform these days, and it's kind of become a little bit overused and almost to the point of being abused. But when, when you're considering a platform, when you're considering a, an IT operations management solution, you really need to look at the, at, the, um, at the details. Is it just somebody taking a bunch of different solutions, bundling them up together and calling it, hey, here's a, um, you know, here's a platform or, do they really have sharing of information and, and context and the ability to get more out of the tools together than it is using you know, each individual tool? And with Helix, one of the important things is that we've redesigned the way we do IT operations management. We've re-architected the solutions to work together as a single platform. So that's just a little bit about the platform. Um, does anybody have so if anybody has any questions, you can either put it in the Q&A or uh, now may be a good time to, um, to go off mute or, or ask to ask a question. I have unmuted everyone. So if you do have any questions um, and you don't actually want to speak, if you want to put it into the Q&A, we can answer those live or we can answer them during the uh, session. So we'll just give a bit of a pause. You can also raise your hand as well if you do actually want to talk. For now, there isn't okay, any, I yeah. would move on. Okay. Okay, great. So now let's zoom in, let's double click on Helix Continuous Optimization. And this is kind of a summary slide of the four major themes that we have that are available only in BHCO and not available in TSCO. And here we list some of the, the unique features. So. The four themes that we have is platform integration. So I talked about it a little bit before. We've taken BHCO, we've modernized it, we've rebuilt it from the ground up, and we re-architected it. So we basically took and looked at the functionality we had in TSCO, built it from scratch in BHCO, just making it more modern and making it 
better with all of these new features. So platform integration, modernization, predictive service management, a really, really important one. So we're going to be talking about that a little bit uh, in, in some of my next slides. Modernization, dashboard and reporting, again, a very important theme here. So you can see the stars, so the stars denote uh, specific features that I'm going to be highlighting in the next slides. And what you're going to see is that these four themes, uh, when we get to Komal's presentation about the roadmap ahead and what we're, um, we're planning for BHCO uh, looking into the future, you're going to see that we're, we're staying with these four themes, right? Because we believe that these will bring the most value to you as, as our users and as our customers. Um, so let's kind of dive into the specific features and everything you're going to see now that has that green banner on the, on the top right corner, this is already available today in BHCL. So the first one is we've taken Kubernetes optimization and application assurance, and we've taken it a step further. We're able to provide our customers the, the ability to have a full comprehensive view of their Kubernetes estates, get all the information they need to be able to do right sizing of resources, to be able to reduce costs. We're also giving recommendations with automation opportunities. So we not only tell you, hey, here's what you need to do in order to stay safe and avoid service issues with your Kubernetes environment, and we don't only tell you, hey, here's where you might be wasting resources or, or underutilizing the resources that you have in Kubernetes. We also give you an opportunity to automate actions to fix these issues. And this is, again, I don't know if you can see this in the screenshot here, but you can dive into the level of details you want anywhere from the pods to the clusters to the containers. It's, you know, it's all in there and you get all the information and all of that gets kind of boiled down into the recommendations. Um, the next feature that, that I'm going to be talking about has to do with our predictive service theme. And we have three features that we're going to be talking about here for the predictive service management. And what's really unique about predictive service management is that this is something that's built on proprietary technology that we built in BMC. So we started off with you know, building and, and patenting actually this new technology. Then we started off with the business driver growth prediction. And this feature allows you to answer a seemingly simple question, which is how much growth in terms of business critical KPIs, which we call business drivers, can your current infrastructure support? So if you're familiar with our business service view, in the business service view in BHCO, you're able to see for each one of your business services, all of the associated business drivers and how much growth of each one of these business drivers can your current infrastructure support? So, you know, if you, just as an example, if you have an e-commerce website and there's an iPhone, a new iPhone going to be introduced next month, or in our case, in a couple of months, you want to know how many more visitors to your website can your current infrastructure support? And what's unique about this is that we're able to calculate the answer to that question in the background. So you don't have to build any models. You don't have to do correlations. You don't have to deal with, you know, with the 14 different forecasting algorithms that we have in the tool. You can just go into the business service view and see for each one of the business services how much growth can each one of the business KPIs, so the business drivers, can your infrastructure support? Now, this is very powerful. In TSCO, you could do the same thing, but it would take a lot of work, a lot of effort, and 
what what our customers are telling us, it also takes a lot of trial and error. Because if you look at the matrix of different correlation algorithms, so we have 14 different correlation algorithms and the different prediction and forecasting algorithms that we have, it's virtually impossible to try and go over each one of the business drivers for each one of the business services. And what we've done is using machine learning, we're able to look in the past, find the right algorithms, do the right correlations, find the right forecasting algorithms to give you the most precise result for each one of your business drivers. So that's a business driver gross prediction. But we didn't really stop here because that just tells you if you can, you know, how much growth in each one of the business drivers you can support today. But we've also added the ability to do what-if simulation for business services. So going back to our iPhone example, let's say you know that last year or two years ago, when the new iPhone was introduced, the number of people uh, going to your website or the number of people using their credit card or the number of people putting something in their shopping bag went up by 300%. You may want to ask the question, what do I need to do in order to support that expected growth? Now, Graham's going to show us how that's actually done. But what this does is it not only tells you, can you support it or not? It also tells you what you need to do in order to support it. So it will give you recommendations. You may need to add more resources, so expanding outwards, or you may want to add additional uh, pods or, or containers, so growing upwards. And you have all that, and you have automated recommendations. We also give you all the details about which resource is the most constraining and where it is and how you can avoid trouble in the future. And again, all of this is based on calculations that are done in the background. All you need to do, to do is you go in, you ask a question, and immediately you get the answer. And then we decided to take it one small step forward, and we've created what we call the service risk dashboard. And in this dashboard, you can have a different panel for each one of your business services and see how it was doing in the past, what is it doing right now? So what's the status of it right now? And is it expected to run into trouble in the future? So you can have a single pane of glass that shows you all of your business services and whether you are today ready for an expected growth in the future. So you can see each one of these panels, that's a business service. You see the major KPIs, the, sorry, the, the, the major business, uh, system metrics. And you can see whether you're going to go over a threshold where your current infrastructure can no longer support the demand. The benefit of this is, like I said, having the single pane of glass, being able to, to perform what are essentially SRE functions on a business level and not on an infrastructure level, service assurance, optimization, reduction of cost of operational costs. It's, it all kind of boils down into this one single dashboard that you get, again, you get this out of the box with the tool. So if we're talking about um, dashboards, so one of the new things and really you know, if we're talking about modernization, this is one of the huge steps that we did in modernizing the tool is the introduction of what we call Helix Dashboard. So Helix Dashboard is part of our platform, of the Helix platform. So each one of the solutions can use Helix Dashboards. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to have access to all of the Helix information that you need. So it can be optimization information from BHCO, it can be topology information from, from discovery, it can be monitoring events and information uh, from uh, Helix operations management and Helix service monitoring. You can get all that information into Helix dashboards, which is built on top of Grafana Pro. 
So you can get all that information into Grafana, into Helix dashboards, and build your own dashboards. Plus, with the tools, you also get out-of-the-box dashboards that you can use. But if you remember when I was talking about the platform, the platform doesn't just share information. So it's not just that Helix dashboards or Grafana here has access to the information of all the tools. It's also a common services platform. So what you can do is because Helix Continuous Optimization has data prediction services, you can now use those data prediction services inside Grafana when you're using it in Helix dashboards. So you now can take any time series that you have. It may be it's a time series that comes from Helix, or it just may be any external time series that you have. If you can pull that information and bring it into Helix dashboards, you can now use the 14 prediction algorithms plus what we call the automatic prediction algorithm, which is an automated AI tool that selects the right forecasting algorithms for you. And you can now forecast any time series out into the future. So this is a really, you know, really powerful extension that, that I think really highlights the, the value of the tool and the value of the platform. Now, if, uh, if any of you don't have BHCO yet, you can actually go to our website. And if you go to the Helix Continuous Optimization page, you'll see a link where you can actually have a free tool that's available on the web. All you need to do is register and use it. It's called FAST, so that's uh, forecasting as a service tool. And there you can just bring in any time series you have and play around with the prediction services from BHCO. So I encourage you to go to um, to our uh, to to the main page. So that would be bmc.com/optimize, and you know where you can play around with this tool. If, if for any reason you don't get there, you can always uh, ping us on the community or in the questions. So any any questions so far? Before I move on to the next yeah. feature. There's nothing in the Q and A, but does anyone have any questions? Why we take a break to the next slides? either if you want to unmute yourself or put something into the Q&A section. Again, you can do that during the whole of this uh, webinar session. Um, I've, I've, I've got a question, Sam, um, and Aaron. Um, in terms of um, time filtering, chronological filtering, if I'm looking at business metrics, I might be interested if, I, if I'm a, a financial institution, the first working day and the last working day of the month. And that's that's the critical time period. So I want to understand what normality is for those peak periods and then what my available uh, headroom is and not dilute that with all of the other stuff. Can you can you can you filter on that that kind of criteria? Absolutely. And and you actually, Jim, thank you for that. Uh, you you mentioned a very important point that's actually in the in the in the title here that I just missed the data marts. So what we do is we uh, enable sharing of information within the platform, including data mart information. So what you can do is you can take your time series in BHCO, filter out through a data mart, only the relevant, you know, only the relevant periods you're interested in. And then that data becomes available for Helix dashboards. And now you can do your predictions. Cool. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so yeah, that's actually, but uh, again, I just want to kind of stress that point because it's, it is it is really an important point. Um, so anything you have in data marts, so your data marts get moved from TSCO to BHCO. So any data mart information you have in BHCO is available to Helix dashboards. So all that data you can now use for building dashboards, for building reports, and you know, honestly, Grafana is arguably one of the best um, dashboarding and reporting tool out there in the market today. So you get all of that power of Grafana with all of the power of the data marts you already have in one tool. So you know, I've seen some of our customers do amazing. 
things with this. I mean, just the flexibility and the user, you know, the user experience that you get from having uh, Helix dashboards and Grafana. Um, you know, it's used for operational teams. It's used for executive alignment. So if you want, you know, if you want an executive to go in and just see, you know, very basic, very simple kind of dashboard type things. Um, I've seen customers use it for compliance. Uh, so if you have compliance reports or, or monitoring uh, that you need to do for compliance, all that gets gets funneled into Helix dashboards where you have a lot of flexibility. And like I said, this is one of the, the really, really cool things that's only available in BHCL. Does anybody yeah, else have any questions? Yeah, Jim, please. Sorry, sorry, just, just one follow-up question that's occurred to me. The, the construct for the business service view is pretty prescriptive in terms of how it wants the business service to be defined in terms of business service, application services, um, and, and appropriate tagging for things like importance, criticality, and uh, uh, what layer of the application tier it is. Um, with the integration with things like dynamic service modeling, is that being automated and not so much enforced, but um, exploited to be able to do that kind of um, uh, uh, categorization so that it, it automatically feeds into the business service views and, and so on and so forth? So maybe I'll let one of our, our panelists take this. Okay. Yeah, so let me answer that. Uh, so through DSM integration or dynamic service model integration, we are able to integrate with discovery, right? And discovery itself has a connection to different APM solutions uh, from where you can get the ready-made defined service model. But we are also enhancing our services, uh, you know, our capabilities in AI ops or in discovery, which is called as blueprints. So yes. blueprint is nothing but a template, right? Which is very useful, which is getting also used in our BMCIT now, where um, the way you are saying, right, automatically building the service model, right? It, it helps a lot. It helps a lot. We have seen it. So definitely that will help you to build a model. And with DSM integration, you can bring those uh, service model in the SEO in the future. Right now, blueprints are not supported, but that is something uh, we have in our roadmap so that you can bring that in in the SEO and can use it. Right, Does that so, so that, that kind, of, kind of supersedes the whole need to have a, a point to point integration with either CMDB or, or, or discovery per se. It's, it's exploiting that Helix platform and the shared services. Correct, correct. That's the, I mean, that's the power of Helix uh, platform also, right? So once it is built, it can be used everywhere. Yeah. Okay. And, and Jim, one more point I would like to add. Let's say you have a DSM, right? So you get a service model directly from the DSM and BSCO. So once you get a service model, you already have the hierarchy in place. Okay, so you don't need to really you don't need to define the tax per se because once you have the business service and application service and everything hierarchy in place, automatically the service pools will be created. On top of those, if you want to further segregate the VMs or systems uh, based on some further subtypes, then you can define tags. Otherwise, you can go ahead with the default service pools that are created as a result of uh, the service model that would be imported from the DSM perspective. So that, that's how it works. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Okay, Do you have anything see. else? No, no. Well, no, we've I'll got be, another. I'll be quiet, quiet for a bit now. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> this is what it's for. So we have got a raised hand. George, can you hear us? I did put you on mute um, just until we reached you. Do you want to ask your question? Oh, uh, yes. Thanks. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a user of TSEO. Um, on TSEO, I'm able to build the right systems when we have uh, two servers uh, in two different data centers accounting mm -hmm. for failover. Uh, so I want to know if this is possible uh, to do um, BHCO. Well, thanks for the question. This is exactly the type of questions that I love answering. Yes. The answer is yes. 
it is supported in BHCL today. Great, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for the question. That was a very quick one. Do you have anything else, uh, George, why we unmuted you? Is there any other questions at the moment? Good. OK, I think, uh, Yaron, that's all we've got at the moment um, looking at the Q&A. So I don't know if you want to move on and we can take some more questions if people want to drop them into the Q&A. And when we get a chance, we can debrief again. OK, yeah, I mean, uh, I'd rather stay with the Q&A. That's a fun part. But uh, so let's go forward. Um, so I think this is the last uh, last one kind that I kind of want to double click on. And it's what we call the CM as a cloud migration simulator. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to take either a single entity like a server or a workload. So that's a bunch of, of infrastructure or a workload and see what it would look like to either move it from on-prem to the cloud, from one cloud provider to another, or even in a multi-cloud environment. So what we're able to do with CMS with a cloud migration simulator is because we know how to monitor and see usage over time of your different resources, we know exactly how many resources, how much resources those entities, those, those services need. And then we can simulate moving that workload or that service to the cloud and we have a catalog of information for all five major cloud providers. So we can simulate what it would look like, and we can give you recommendations about two things. We can tell you how much it's going to cost you to move this workload to the cloud for each one of the cloud providers. So this is a, a huge savings opportunity. But we also tell you in, in great detail which service you should be using for each one of the cloud providers in order to support the current workload that, that you're simulating the migration for. And we don't do it as lift and shift. We do what we call utilization-based migration. So because we know how many resources the service is using right now, we can calculate and know what the right infrastructure in the cloud is to support that same workload for what it actually needs, not necessarily for what it actually has right now. So you may be under utilizing or even over utilizing your existing infrastructure, but that doesn't matter. We'll give you the recommendation for the right service in the cloud to use, how much it's going to cost. You can select different zones of service, so different regions for each one of the cloud providers. And what we do is we don't just look for each of the cloud providers and for each of the services, what the cloud provider publishes that this service can do. We actually have benchmark information about all of the services provided by every one of the cloud providers that we keep updated on a monthly basis, or every month we update our catalog with benchmarking information for each one of these services. So we can always pick the right service based on each one of our customers' unique individual needs for each one of their services. Now, if you think about it, just the sheer matrix of options is staggering. If you wanted to do this manually, so check each, each cloud provider, each service, what do they provide, and then look at each one of your services that you want to migrate to the cloud, see what it's using and trying to find the right, the right alternative, that's just not doable. It's not sustainable, it's not doable. This does it automatically, and because we have all the information, it's a single click. You say, here's a service I want to migrate to the cloud, show me what it's going to look like, and immediately you get these results, that show you, okay, here's your existing service. Here's how much it's costing you today. So if it's an on-prem service, we're showing you how much it's costing you to maintain it on-prem. And we show you how much it's going to cost in each one of the cloud providers, uh, if you're paying monthly or yearly or for three years. And we recommend which service you want to use for each one of the services that you want to migrate. So 
that's the end of of this presentation. There's a lot more detailed, like like uh, like the question we just had about derived entities and things like that. So I really, just in the interest of time, I didn't go into great details about each one of these, but please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or if you want to, um, you know, learn any, you know, learn more about this. And with that, um, if there are any questions. There isn't any at the moment, but what I will say is at the end, um, when we do send out the survey, if there's any other topics that have briefly been mentioned today, whether you want more content, then please fill it in and I will go back to the presenters and any additional stuff that we need to help you with the webinars. Um, okay. But I believe we're now moving over to Comal. Yeah, so um, at this point, I'm going to switch it over to uh, Kumal to talk a little bit about the future. Now let us talk about what are the migration drivers, why we are asking you to, to migrate from TSCO to BHCO, right? What are the benefits of it? Um, and a little bit on how it will look like, right, in, in the new environment. So first thing we already talked about the new value, right? We have seen all the features that we are developing only in BSCO, not in TSCO. And what we have in the roadmap for the next year, right? What are the exciting stuff that are coming? So that is entire new value that you will get only on BSCO, not on TSCO. Second is scalability, compliance, and security, right? These are the things that you have to take care when you have your own environment. Right, you have to look at the how you scale that application, you know, BSCO solution itself or TS. Uh, you have to maintain the compliance of that uh, infrastructure resources that you are using, as well as you have to keep on top of your security, right? So you have to put time, effort, and resources to maintain that, right? And it has to happen. I mean, you have always. Com uh, compliance that you need to follow, security standards that you need to follow. And of course, for the high availability, you have to look at the scalability. And all these uh, actually result into more costs, right? You need to have a team of experts who look into it. Uh, and you have to have database export uh, so that he you can maintain the database property. So all that. And again, apart from that, then there are operations that you have to follow, right? Upgrades, maintenance, and uh, patches that you have to apply. So all these are things that are applicable for the on-premises software, right? So this all you can avoid. Uh, next slide here on. If you go to BSO, which is a SaaS solution. So, uh, I mean, we have started providing this like now one year back that it is fully functional uh, uh, BSO, right? Now with that, these are the benefits that you're going to get. So first of all, you get rid of maintenance and upgrade. So it is BMC's responsibility to upgrade that uh, software. It, was, it will be always on the recent releases. That means you will be on the uh, recent releases and all the features that we are releasing, right? It will be available on the production and it will be available for you to use. So some of the features you might have to need, uh, need to do some little bit configuration, but some of the features will be, uh, I mean, automatically get available and you start seeing the results of those features. So that way you are reducing the time to value, right, of that software, of that uh, purchase that we have done. Uh, next is admin function reduction. So in the um, current scenario in TSO, as I said, you need to have a database export team. If there are any issues, then somebody has to look into it. Then you have to report it to BMC and you have to work on it, right? Uh, you have to keep monitoring that. Then you have to manage the network configurations. You have to manage the certificates of, of your web portals. So those are so many admin functions that you have to look into it continuously, right? With SaaS, this is all, this all is going to go away, right? Because BMC is responsible for that. We are responsible for the scalability. We are responsible for the compliance and the security. So that's why we are saying, you know, SaaS is the way and customers or companies are moving to SaaS, right? Nobody wants to maintain all these infrastructure on premises. Uh, next benefit is uh, hardware reduction. So now there will be uh, less uh, 
on premises resources only remote ETL, vm for a remote ETL engine that you need uh, that you maintain on premises so this definitely save you power and pulling cost as well and def and also we moved uh, from oracle or relational database uh, with the new architecture so that's why you don't need to buy that uh, expensive Oracle license as well. Uh, apart from that, like service availability or architecture and platform, we already talked about, right? So this is a new uh, ground up build solution, uh, build solution, which is microservice based, containerized uh, with latest technologies. It is highly scalable, it is faster, right? So, and BMC is committed to the 99.9% .9 availability. So therefore uh, we are responsible for uh, providing all these things uh, along with the benefit of platforms. Um, also, we are taking care of the backup and the restore. So for, as, uh, as I'm saying there, you get two environments when you get the solution. So pre-prod and prod, and we are responsible for the uh, backups and restore uh, of those um, uh, data stores that we use for the solution. So that is all the benefits of uh, getting migrated to SaaS. And this is not the only SaaS, but some of these are still applicable if you choose the new solution in the on-prem uh, infrastructure as well. So some of the things BMC are still responsible when they provide uh, BSC on-prem. So okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kamal, I'm sorry. We, we, need to, uh, yeah. we need to leave just a little bit of time for, for Graham. <laughs> I know I ran a little bit long. Um, so uh, unless there are any uh, questions right now, we can uh, jump right into the live demo, no, Graham. There's nothing at the moment, please move on. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Kamal. Thank you, Kamal. Yeah, thank you, Kamal. Thank you, Yaron. Let me just share my screen. That wasn't very successful, was it? <laughs> Let's try just sharing the one window. See if that works. There we go. Hopefully that's better. Yeah, it's great. Okay. You can see. Right. Brilliant. So thank you. Yeah, I was just going to quickly try and um, talk through and, and show a demo of the mainly the various um, features that uh, Yaron had uh, been through. And um, we can uh, see those uh, working working live. So firstly, at this this top level business service view, uh, those of you, I um, think most people on here will be used to TSCO. You, you're used to seeing the, the saturation by service importance that's available that looks at the infrastructure um, metrics and, and predicts forwards. But now you will see, as, as Yaron was saying, that the business driver predictions. So based on your um, grouping of your business drivers to your, to your services, it's now automatically giving us the amount of growth that's supported for each particular business driver. So if I think about it, probably makes sense. Let's see if it takes yes, it will still work in this sharing. So you're used to see it, you know, you, you've allocated business drivers to particular um, business services. And at the moment with TSCO, you'd have to go and build your um, correlations and modeling and, and so on. And as you can see, we haven't got any of that within here and it's automatically doing that for us across all of our business services and the business drivers so that we are then quickly able to see the um, amount of growth that's supported by those particular business drivers as Yaron was saying earlier so it's giving you that uh, information automatically without you having to go and build um, that analysis within within the tool I suppose one, one thing that sprung to mind while, um, and the, particularly like the question around derived entities and, and so on, we're, we're very much talking today about the new features, the new capabilities on top of the existing capabilities. So as you saw there, as I've flashed over to the, to the workspace, then you, you've got all of the same things that, that you've got before, but you've got all of these additional features, the additional things we're talking about, the additional linkage with dynamic service models, 
that doesn't mean you you know you can still use you can still build the domains up yourself and 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 so on but if you've got uh, discovery if you've got dynamic service models and intelligent integration you can make use of those and um, use that information automatically so i just wanted to make to make that clear because there, there may be i know when we talk to customers there's questions about can i do what i'm still doing and the answer is yes but we're, we're trying to highlight some of the additional things that are available as well. I need to move that window out of the way. Okay, so we're automatically forward uh, forecasting the business drivers and being able to see how much is supported. Now, it was also we were also talking about the the what if simulation. So if I go down to um, a particular business service here from um, my service views. We can now actually do a what if simulation based on the model that it's built for us automatically. So it's um, done the correlation for us. It's understood how the business drivers correlate with the underlying components that make up that uh, business service. And we can go in and say, well, we know that something's going to happen from a business perspective. How's that going to impact our underlying infrastructure? Have we got enough uh, resources to be able to support that. So we've got the initial um, prediction here for the uh, next six months, and it's saying it's it's fine based on what um, we're seeing historically. It's already applied the um, growth projection. So based on the growth it's seen on this particular business driver, it's applied that and it's understood that um, the current infrastructure is enough to support the demand we expect. And um, we can actually go in and say, well, we want to, we know that something is going to happen, um, that, um, you know, whether it's uh, that a new new release is going out, I think I chose Jira, so perhaps there's a new release and we expect there to be some um, new uh, incidents or um, enhancements put in, and so we can say we expect there to be you know, 40% growth, and we can specify at what point that's going to happen. So we can go and choose um, the dates that that's going to happen. And then it will recalculate the business driver for us, and we can see the, the growth in that. Um, you can specify an end date. It might be something that you're expecting as a, um, a, a um, blip, a peak that's going to go back down, or it could be a an, an ongoing um, growth you can also have uh, multiple um, growths that you apply there so i've just put a, a, a single one in you may have a more staggered um growth that you're expecting a 10 percent and another 10 percent another 20 percent or something on different dates you can do all of that as well now having um provided that uh information we can now see that it's highlighting that if that growth happens then at that point we're going to see there's a, a problem with the underlying infrastructure if we scroll down we can see some more detail we can see the different um, pools that make up our actual uh, business service and we can drill in and actually see um, what the uh, identified issue is and we can see there's a, a cpu constraint we can see that um, when when that's going to happen, the threshold that's that's gone through, and so on. So all of this is automated for us. You know, I've not had to go in and set any of this up. This is all created for us based on the fact that our um, business drivers appear in the same um, domain within our business service, and it's all automatically handled for us. Now, having identified that there's a problem that's uh, going to happen it will also give us a recommendation about the resizing and we can either select and say yes we're going to take its um, recommendation or we can add a, a custom resize so we're able to um, go and make um, our own choice if we want to add additional resources to the pool or if we want to scale up existing resources so you have those those options I will just the point of um, getting through this quickly i'll just select the recommended scale out and apply the changes and we can see um once it's uh, analyzed that it's it's now gone through and 
what it's recommended should be fine. We're going to be fine for the next um, six months. Now, we are able to go through and change the forecast forward time. So we could do it to 12 months and, and so on. Um, and we can also come down and see the uh, the detail again. So we can see, you know, we've still got things that are going towards a, a threshold, but everything should be fine based on the activity we've seen. So it's just trying to um, it give you the ability to do this in a far easier and simpler way. You can still do all of the things that uh, you do at the moment with the, the product in terms of the modeling and correlation, but this is giving you an easier way to um, analyze that and perform that across all of the business services without you need to go and build all of those um, underlying models and correlations yourself separately. And those analysis can be saved and um, come back and you can um, you tweak them, change them, et cetera. I've chosen a business service here with just one business driver. If I'd gone into a business service with multiple business drivers, then you could change each of those individually, different amounts of um, increase and, and so on. Okay, let's quickly jump and something else that uh, was was talked about earlier as well was about the the, the kubernetes um views and, and recommendation and simulation so you will already see you've got some views on kubernetes in tsco but we now have um things like the the recommendations within here where if you've got um uh, forecast saturation of infrastructure or the containers. So obviously there's multiple layers within a Kubernetes environment in terms of the, the containers, deployments, the pods, the infrastructure and the, the potential sort of VMs and things that you're using within there. So looking at all of those different layers, looking at the saturation that um, can be forecast within there so you can understand that where you've got oversubscription so things are working fine, but if people actually, or if all the components start using what you've promised them, there's potentially an issue. And then things like over allocation. So as we all know, continuous optimization is about being able to make sure you've got the right resource at the right time. So it's not just about having enough, it's making sure you have an over provision. So where you've got over allocated components, it's highlighting those to you. And we are able to also do things like automate the changes to that. So if you've seen um, uh, updates and um, presentations and demos on uh, things like AI ops and other areas of the Helix platform, you'll have seen intelligent automation, which allows us to manage um, automation tools and perform actions against the systems. Now, well, intelligent automation is another one of those common services. So um, continuous optimization can make use of that to actually uh, make changes to an environment where we want to allow it to do that. So where we've got a Kubernetes environment, we could get it to reconfigure um, the components and um, reclaim resources for us. So we're able to um, initiate that from within here if that's something we wanted to do as well. There is also the um, what if against our um, individual components here as well. So similarly to the what if we had at the business service, we can say what happens if we see an increase in um, resource requirements for our Kubernetes um, environment, and we can choose multiple different controllers and containers and perform those actions and, and forecast forward. Now, let me quickly, well, we've run out of time already. So let me just quickly touch on two other things. One is the um, Grafana dashboards. As was um, discussed earlier, we have um, out of the box um, risk dashboards associated with the business services. You can either see all of your business services and the, the forecast forward, or we can cut it down to individual business services. Um, that we're interested in. And Grafana is a very rich um, 
dashboarding tool allowing us to um, view any of our data across the Helix platform. So if I um, just give an example of you know, some other things that, that we can do with that, there's lots of different visualizations. This is one that's just pulling straight from a data mart. So you're able to use both the out of the box data marts, data marts you've built yourself. All of those can be visualized through Grafana alongside pulling together data from the other components within um, Helix as well. Okay, and then let me just get back to here and I'll quickly touch on the migration simulation. So Yaron uh, was talking about the, the cloud migration simulation. So we've got our business services that we're collecting data on within our um, environment. And we can say, well, what happens if we want to actually migrate that um, to the cloud? And we can see for that particular business service, you can see the cost on premise, and that's the you know the, the cost of the on premise environment is something you input the um, information for in terms of how much you might charge for VMs and servers and so on, and then it will look at how that could be migrated to your different cloud environments. You can choose if you want to just have a couple of the cloud environments, or if you want all of those listed, you can see the comparison between them all. And it will show us um, the costs of those. But it's I'm going through, as was uh, mentioned earlier, it's looking at all of the components that make up our um, on-premise business service. We can see um, information about the um, configuration of that and um, high-level utilization of those. And then it will recommend what resources would be required in the cloud provider that's selected. So at the moment, this is selected for the Oracle um, cloud environment. And you can see that it's doing optimization, both in terms of increasing resources and um, removing resources where relevant. So on this first line, um, you can see you know, things like the CPU on the existing system is um, being fairly highly utilized and it's increasing the CPU. Um, memory wise, it's uh, decreasing that because those are the recommendations. So as we do our move, we can actually see the resources that are required to keep our business service running and what the recommendation would be for that cloud platform. Now, you can choose different locations for these um, cloud platforms. Sometimes choosing a different location would give you a, a um, different price. But then also, if we go and choose a different cloud provider, you will see things like the instance types have changed. And um, some of these um, other values will change as well because different options are available for different um, instance types in different cloud providers. So it's got a lot of knowledge about what, what's available, what um, uh, that sort of what capabilities of those different um, instance types are and matching that up against what you're currently using on premise so that you've got the best information you can to actually do that migration through. And it will provide you all of that information. You can export that out and um, then use that to perform your migration within your environment. Okay, so that was a very quick fly through. And um, I don't know if there's any other questions at this point. Otherwise, I will we, we'll hand back yeah, to Sam. We don't have any questions, but um, I'm conscious we have run over. But uh, if everyone's got a few more minutes, um, we can answer a further few questions. Otherwise, what I will be doing is posting um, if it's not today, tomorrow, uh, the link for all of the content that's shared today, um, we will be able to get some of it up onto YouTube um, and also an opportunity to fill in the survey. In that survey, we'll give you the opportunity to say what you'd like to see as content. Um, quite conscious there was a lot covered today. Um, I know there's some areas and topics that a few have already given us for content for the future. Um, and you can follow our webinar page. Plus, we do make recommendations on training as well. So if that's something that you are going to require, then do also reach out to me. Um, so 
just open up the lines before everyone dashes. If there isn't anything else, obviously we'll close it in a minute or two. And thanks, Graham. Just making sure everyone's unmuted. OK, I would say then we can wrap this session. So thank you to our um, panellists and thank you to obviously the presenters today. So if there is any further follow up, feel free to reach out to me. I can also reach out to the panel and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.